Hello, and welcome back to the Eyes Up Life podcast with your host, Ben Garanis. That is me. Eyes Up started as a 7,000-mile bike ride that I did solo around the United States to raise awareness for distracted driving. Along the way, I met hundreds of people, spoke to tons of people about distracted driving, their own experiences, as well as digital wellness and what it means to live eyes up. And along the way, I became really committed to this cause. And now I am focused on spreading the message and hopefully making our roads safer in the most impactful way that I can. Immediately after finishing the ride in September of last year, I set out on a road trip to interview 21 athletes who are sponsored by Maxxis Tires. So I partnered up with Maxxis. They helped connect me to these amazing people, and they sat down with me for about an hour, shared their story, and we just talked. And these are the full conversations that I had with these folks. To get a shorter glimpse of the conversation in a video format, check out the video and all of the videos that have been released so far on my Instagram page, Eyes Up Ride. They're also available on the Maxis Tires YouTube page. This week we have a brother pair, Cody and Hunter Miller. They are from Texas. I met them in Texas. I'm so, here's a little sidebar. I'm so grateful for this experience because I got to see a lot of the southern portion of the United States and travel to new states that I had never been to, including Texas. So I went to the Miller Brothers shop on a super rainy day in Texas in late October, and we sat down between the bouts of downpours and just talked. They have a pretty fun dynamic and I know you'll enjoy my conversation with Cody and Hunter. I guess I didn't really give you any background on them. Cody and Hunter are professional UTV racers. So two guests ago, we had Dustin Jones, who's also a professional UTV racer. They often compete against Dustin and often sweep the podium between the three of them. So find someplace comfy to sit down or do something fun while you're listening to this, my conversation with Cody and Hunter Miller. Enjoy, and we'll talk to you at the end. Uh, my name's Hunter Miller, and I'm from Greenville, Texas. My name's Cody Miller. I'm from Greenville, Texas. So you guys are brothers. Yeah, we're brothers. We've, uh, we've been racing. Choice. Yeah, we've been racing against each other our whole lives, and we like to think that uh, part of the reason for our success is that we always had competition. Uh, we had competition 100% of the time, whether we were practicing or racing. We've always been our closest competitors. It seems like we can't, uh, neither one can quite outrun the other uh, for any given period of time. So usually I'll win a championship and then he'll win the same championship the next year or vice versa and it's just back and forth nonstop. Who's older? I'm older. I'd uh, like to point out Cody hadn't man managed to win KOH yet, though, so. And what's KOH for? Uh, for everybody that doesn't know, KOH is uh, King of the Hammers. It's our biggest race on our calendar every year. Um, runs from the end of January to the beginning of February. Um, it, it's all the big guys that's their main focus. So I haven't won KOH yet, but last year I did finish second, and how did you finish? No, you didn't. I got second. You, you got, like, 15th. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I haven't won KOH yet, but I'd like or to even point done out very that good, uh, so. <laughs> I did finish the 4400 race in eighth place this year. And how'd you finish? I didn't. Oh, <laughs> nobody remembers that though. Um, so explain to me and to everyone who doesn't know what sort of racing you do, what what you race, and what what that's like. So Cody and I both race a Can-Am X3 uh, side by side. So they're basically uh, production-based off-road vehicles that start in, in stock form. Uh, it's just kind of a sport recreation vehicle for the average person. Uh, we take them and we modify them a little bit and turn them into full-blown race cars. 
So those are like what's behind you, right? The, yep, that's exactly right. Got it. Cool. Yep. So and if you could just walk me through both of your careers, like how did you get into the power sport world, and did you did you know that you wanted to one day be a, a UTV racer? No, we didn't. Uh, we did never think we were gonna end up racing UTVs when we first started because they didn't exist. So, um, you know, at least in the form they are now. So we started racing when I was six years old, um, I'm 36 now. So um, we started when we were little kids on dirt bikes. My dad got us some for Christmas and started racing each other in the pasture and then went on to our local motocross track, um, eventually got onto quads and started racing motocross on quads, went all the way through um, a professional career in those um, and we were both racing for Can-Am in 2011, and they asked if we had any interest in getting into side-by-sides. Uh, it was a brand new segment for them, and they had just come out with the Commander. Um, so, of course, we, we took them up on that, and local series started, created a class form as a cross-country series, and it just kind of grew from there. Um, around 2014, we switched, retired from ATV motocross and are now focused 100% on side by side since then. So, did you guys start at the same time, or was it something where Hunter started as the older? How much older are you? Now? I'm I'm only a year older. Okay, so yeah, Cody Cody turned 35 yesterday, and I'm 36. Oh, happy so. birthday! Cody. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, did you guys jump into it at the same time, or? Yeah, we pretty much jumped into racing at the same time. We were always uh, competing against one another. We we both started out on on small four wheelers, uh, like 200 cc two strokes, and competed in that and uh, before we were even old enough we switched over to like 250 full-size ATVs and uh, you know it was, looked like just a helmet riding around on a on the track because we were so small but uh, we learned a lot doing that and uh, kept competing against one another and anytime one of us would move up in a class the other would basically do the same and we won you know quite a few championships throughout our years uh, competing against one another and against everyone else and you know, eventually we went from the amateur ranks to professional, and then eventually we became, you know, some of the fastest guys around on ATVs, and uh, we took all of those skills and, and transferred it right over into side-by-sides at the same time. And uh, immediately, whenever we started racing side-by-sides, we were winning championships, and we've won championships ever since, and that's been for the last 10 years now. What was something growing up that fed in? I wouldn't say there was a particular thing that fed into it. Um, this is just all we know, you know? We, we never got into uh, football or baseball or regular stuff. I mean, I did play in high school, but I was, I was better at handing the good guys water than I was at uh, actually catching a football, so. Even golf, I still play golf today and I still suck at it. But uh, still enjoy doing it, but uh, racing is certainly where we, uh, where we shine and we've been able to make a career out of it. Um, I'd say the trait that uh, gets us ahead of, of most other people, I guess, would just come down to our work ethic. Um, these things are a ton of work, and the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. You know, just constantly, always trying to improve, always trying to make things better. Um, so, work ethic is definitely one of the big ones, for sure. I would say another thing that's helped us to be successful is our understanding of equipment and the way the mechanics of the thing works. Uh, we build all of our own race cars and we build race cars for other people and uh, that that's certainly set us apart from our competition in a lot of ways and that we understand what it takes to adjust the machine properly so that it works the best that it can out on the track. How did you learn all that? Uh, pretty much everything is self-taught. You know, when we first started, my dad worked on our stuff a little bit, but uh, from the time we were, we were very young, he always made us work on our own, our own equipment. And uh, you learn to respect it a lot more when you're the one that has to fix it as well. So 
um, you know, it just evolved over time, you know, like any, any job, I guess. Uh, the more you do it, the more you learn and the more experience you have. So, Hunter, you were talking about your upcoming schedule and you have some testing going on and then a couple races a little bit down the stretch here. What are, what are you working on when you're not racing and sort of preparing? Do you do any training for these or is it mostly really just working on? Uh, so when we're not racing, 90% um, of our time is, is spent preparing for the next race. Um, we have a schedule laid out in front of us at the beginning of the year, and so we know what's coming up. Uh, different races require different setups, so um, when we finish with one, we're, we're setting up for the next one. Um, whether it's another short course race or a desert race or uh, a rock race or a cross country race, just depending on what it is, we're, we're either building a new vehicle or altering a different uh, one for that type of event. Um, other than that, you know, I, I try to have somewhat of a normal life if I can. Uh, in my free time, I like to do a lot of cycling and, um, you know, these things are very physically demanding, uh, physically as well as mentally. Um, I would almost say mentally more so than physically, but you've got to keep fairly fit in order to be at 100% for the entire duration of the race. I mean, some races last upwards of 12 hours. So uh, when you're out there that long, um, of course, it wears you down. So the more physically tired you get, the more mentally tired you get, and leads to mistakes and crashes and, and things like that. All right, so, uh, so do some cycling when, uh, when you can. How about you, Cody? What do you like to do when you're not working on or preparing for a race? Uh, in my free time, um, my dad's kind of hitting his golden years, and uh, we spend a good bit of time offshore fishing. Uh, we travel out there probably a dozen times a year. We go out, you know, 50, 60, 100 miles offshore, and uh, we get to be the captain and the guide and everything all at once, and we usually bring back boatloads of fish, and we have a great time doing it. You know, we're just kind of making memories and uh, enjoying life and enjoying being outdoors. You know, I also like to hunt and stuff a little bit as well. Certainly just enjoy being uh, in the outdoors. What, uh, where do you guys go fishing? Or, or uh, we go to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's our closest you know, part of the ocean that we can get to. Sometimes we go down to Venice, Louisiana, which is like the very tip of the boot where the Mississippi dumps into the ocean. And uh, if we're not there, then we go down to uh, like Port O'Connor, Port Aransas. Uh, you know, those, those different areas down there. It's still about a six hour drive for us, but uh, you know, the fishing's good and we certainly enjoy it. And then you spend a, a, a good portion of the year uh, on the road traveling for various races and events. So what's, what's that like getting to travel together? Who comes with you? What's, what's that whole process like? We don't actually travel together. <laughs> Typically, uh, you know, our series schedules, our, our season starts late January and it runs through all the way through December pretty much. Um, so we're constantly racing. We're fortunate that a lot of the stuff we do out through throughout the year is relatively close within a couple hours. Um, but a lot of the bigger races, he, he drives all the stuff out there and I hop on an airplane because, <laughs> but uh, not just for fun, but I also help manage our family glass business. So as much time as I can spend here working, uh, the better. And so there's really no point in both of us sitting in, in front seat of a motorhome driving across the country. So tell me about, um, well, tell me what, what comes to mind when you hear distracted driving. Cars crashing into each other. Uh, for me, distracted driving is something I see all the time because I'm, I'm driving around a rig that's uh, 80 feet long and you know it's a semi truck and it doesn't slow down very fast so I always have to give myself a lot of room between me and the traffic in front of me so that uh, if something happens, you know, I can, I can avoid it or slow down in time. And uh, certainly I, I just cringe every time I see someone in a, a passenger vehicle that just is right on the butt end of somebody in front of them and, and swerving in and out of traffic. You know, it's just, it's just an accident waiting to happen. How about for you, Hunter? Yeah, same thing. I mean, you know, smartphones, uh, are such an awesome thing because we have so much access to information, but you also even catch yourself like everybody is completely addicted to them, you know? Um, every second that it's not in their hand, it seems like they just want to grab it and, and look at it, you know, for almost no reason. And, and that transfers over to when people are driving down the road. 
Um, you know, you see people that are are constantly just kind of in and out. They look like they're drunk and you get up beside them and you can see, even though you can't see their phone, they're just staring down at it. And, uh, you know, obviously it's dangerous and scary and and you sit there and you're just getting pissed off watching them, you know, cut you off and cut other people off. And then you get up there and see that and you're like, oh, makes sense, you know? What do you guys think is, uh, I mean, it's a huge issue and one that I think we're all guilty of in one form or another. Um, yeah. being distracted, not necessarily texting while driving, but there's I mean, an increasing number of things in our cars and vehicles that have, that can distract us, like touch screens and everything like that. So what, it doesn't seem like it's trending in a direction that's going to make it easier for us to be distraction free. So what uh, is there something that you think might solve the problem or move us in a more positive direction? You know, as, as scary as it seems to have self-driving vehicles, um, it also seems like that might be safer than what we're dealing with right now, you know. Um, right now, yeah, people are operating the vehicles, but they're only operating it at probably 20%, you know, because the other 80% of the time is sitting there going back and forth between their phone and the road. You know, they probably spend, you know, three or four seconds looking at their phone and then a half a second looking at the road. So, you know, it, it, that's one thing I think uh, that could help possibly. Um, another one would be just a little bit of self-control on everybody's part, but that's a lot easier said than done. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right about self-driving cars. I'll probably eliminate a lot of issues. They're quite a bit down the road, mm -hmm. I imagine, <laughs> given how things are right now. Um, what? What about in the meantime, what's, what would you say to someone who, like Cody, you've seen tons of people from your truck as you're driving or driving the tractor. What, what would you say to them to try to get them to realize the consequences of what they're doing? Um, one of my bigger pet peeves whenever people are driving is that uh, the passing lane is for passing. And now it seems that 90% uh, of the people just want to drive in the passing lane because they feel like that's the faster lane, but and then it ends up just as all the traffic being in the passing lane and then there's just a a few slower paced vehicles over here on the on the slow lane but they're not getting passed by all of these people over here because they've built such a train of, of vehicles in the passing lane that no one can even move down the highway you know there's no people don't get over you know you're supposed to pass the person in the slow lane and then get over and allow that passing lane to be open but no one does that anymore now it's just bumper to bumper traffic in the fast lane and hardly anyone over there in the slow lane where they should be. And that's a, that's a big problem. I mean, a lot of the people that get irritated and start having road rage is because they can't make passes on the highway. You know, they want to go down the road faster than the person in the slow lane, but they can't because of all the people stacked up in the fast lane that aren't paying attention. Right. You could yeah. definitely didn't answer the question, though. No, that's a good thought. I mean, <laughs> I, I totally hear you. And I think you could probably, I mean, you could try to unpack like why people are staying in the passing lane more. And I think one argument you could make is that everyone is so focused on their priorities. And I think that kind of ties into our phone use. And my feeling is that our phones kind of teach us that the world revolves around each and every one of us, not around everyone else. So maybe there's a shift in where people's heads are at. No, absolutely. And a lot of that has to do with social media. You know, everybody, it, it, all they care about is how many likes they get on their photo, you know, so maybe they'll post something and even driving down the road, they're just constantly opening it up to see how many people approved of the, what they had to show the world, you know. And so it, it just feeds into that addiction of, of having to have your phone in your hand at all time. And, you know, that includes driving down the highway. Well, so yeah, so let's talk about your, each of your uses of social media to promote your careers. Like how, how big of a role does it play and what's, what's that like? You know, it's, uh, it's something that we've kind of been uh, groomed into and it's been an actual sponsorship requirement for the last 10 years that we post frequently on social media and reply to posts and, you know, continue on building this relationship with everyone involved so that we have a bit more of a presence in the world because a lot of the people that are 
out there don't actually get to go and see us racing. All that they ever see is what we post on social media. And so certainly it's a it's an important thing, but there's a time and a place for it. You know, you need to do it whenever you're sitting and not right behind the wheel of a vehicle. How like how often do you guys post and how like in your everyday life how how much are you actually on like engaging with social media? You know, I'm uh, I'm engaging with it every single day. I get tons and tons of private messages and, uh, you know, just asking questions about side-by-sides and mechanical questions and technical questions. And, and I really enjoy um, helping people, you know, and, and the easiest way for them to get a hold of me is obviously through social media. Um, I don't, I'm more of a private person, so I don't like to just put my life out there for everybody to see. So most of the stuff that I post is around when we're at races, of course. Um, Cody shows his, his personal life a little more than, uh, than I do, but maybe that's just because he gets to go do more fun stuff than I do, I guess. Hmm. But uh, no, I mean, I, I try to keep everybody up to date with what's going on, with uh, what's relative to my career, obviously. Uh, my personal life, I kind of keep it to myself. I post uh, just about daily, uh, especially on like the storyline, because uh, people like to keep up with it, you know, and the more stuff that I'm able to put out there, just some daily life around the shop or whatever we're doing, if I see something that's interesting to me, I'll pick up my phone and, and film it and put up a 10 or 15 second video of, of something, whether it's funny or interesting or challenging or, or whatever it may be, so that people kind of have a reference for who I am and what I'm doing. and. It allows them to stay more um, engaged in our in our racing platform and, and what we do. You know, it just puts us in front of the audience. Have you guys ever felt the feeling, uh, or have you ever felt like uh, you're sort of getting sucked into social media and you, you kind of like come to and you're like, what's going on? Like, what? what how do you strike a balance in your life? With yeah, I'll I'll notice when I'm sitting on the couch at night watching TV. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll all of a sudden look up and I have no idea what happened in the show and I have no idea what I was looking at on my phone you know you're just like blindly sitting there scrolling through things you know and so especially lately I've tried to really focus on putting my phone over there and just not looking at it you know um, I remember when I was growing up and and we didn't even hardly have cell phones and definitely not smartphones you know that wasn't until uh, I was maybe a freshman in college when those first iPhone came out um, you know and going back to a time when you don't have all that stuff uh, is kind of crazy to think about because you're so used to it now but you know when we go out to King of the Hammers for example there's no cell phone service out there whatsoever um, there's you know during the race there's a little bit of Wi-Fi but for the most part you're completely disconnected from the rest of the world and at first you feel a little bit panicky but uh, within a couple hours or especially within a day um, man, it's like such a big weight is lifted off your shoulder because you're not just constantly thinking about it. You know, you forget about it pretty fast. How about with um, with being on the road uh, generally? Like, what, what what's your approach to your phone in the car? And if you see a notification come through, what's the... For yeah. me, I, I don't have my phone set to send any notifications unless it's a text message or a phone call. Uh, I just feel like it's a little bit of an invasion of my privacy to have constant dings and pops and bells and whistles going off. Uh, if I'm in the vehicle, usually my phone's set on some music and uh, it's always just a standard shuffle of, of songs that I like and you know, I just let it sit there and play music and I look at, at what's in front of me. Yeah, yeah same thing. I, uh... When I'm in the car, I, I try to set my phone in the center console and have it uh, just playing either a podcast or some music, you know. Um, of course, you hear a ding. I don't have my notification silence. So you hear a ding, and your first reaction is to pick it up and look at it. And I'm not going to lie. Of course, I do sometimes. Um, but I definitely make a concentrated effort to not just sit there and look at it and scroll through it, you know. Are you guys aware of the feature on your phone that you can have it silence notifications when you're in the car exclusively? Something that you're familiar with? Or? I, you know, I switched from an iPhone to an Android for about four minutes, and I remember that was the first thing that popped up it's when I was setting the phone up if I want to have it uh, be silenced during driving. 
and I uh, used it and I thought that was great. I just hated the rest of the phone. So I went back to an iPhone and I didn't realize they had it on there. So Yeah, no, iPhones have it. I think they could do a much better job of making it known known to the world. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe yeah. even turn it on as a default. But it's, uh, if you want me to show you, I'm more than happy to. Um, so there's a statistic that um, the average American over the course of their life will spend five years on social media, um, which is a lot of time. Um, what goes through your head when you're thinking about that? Like when I feel like that is a gigantic waste of my life. <laughs> uh, I say that, you know, there are some wonderful things about social media. Um, but overall, I feel like it's not a good thing. Um, I think it started off as a good thing where people would, uh, it was a way for people to connect, you know. Um, I, I know everybody's birthday. First thing when I wake up in the morning, all my friends that have birthdays that day that I would have no idea otherwise, you know. Um, it's great for when people have big life events. Uh, it's great for sharing that news, of course, and it happens like that. Um, on the other hand, it, it has gone in a different direction, you know. I feel like the companies... Uh, the big social media companies, it's all about how much money they can make and so they figured out how to monetize every little piece of it and the way they do that is making it as addicting as possible. So, um, you know, it does have some great things but I feel like uh, overall I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it and especially when you hear a statistic like that that it consumes, you know, five years of your life, uh, it's, it's pretty wild to think about. I think it's kind of a... I think it's kind of a sad thing these days that uh, your phones are constantly listening to everything that you're saying. Even this interview right now, our phones are picking up our keywords and I'll get advertisements after this that are keyed towards what we've said. And that definitely feels like an invasion of privacy. You know, for any of my music apps or anything else, I always pay for a subscription so I don't have to hear the commercials. And then sure enough, as soon as you get on social media and you scroll up twice, you see a, an ad for whatever you are having a conversation about that day. And that certainly feels a little bit intrusive to me. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a wild world, and there's you know there's ways to to turn that off, but they don't make it easy. No, you know it's very no. They they easy. definitely don't tell you how to turn that off uh, up front. That's yeah. for sure, because yeah. that's how they make their money. You know. Absolutely. Um, what would you guys say? Uh, just some advice. You know, you have a lot of people that watch what you do, whether that's person or you know on social media or on these beautiful videos that you have of your races on YouTube um, so people naturally look up to you what would you say to people who are you know aspiring to be maybe not necessarily a UTV racer but um, someone who's trying to pursue something that maybe seems loft, like too lofty or out of reach yeah, you know, there's, there's lots of seminars that you can listen to about success, and a lot of what they have in common is if you have a goal and something you really want to accomplish, you need to write it down and read it just about every single day so that it's in front of you and it's on your mind. You know, you should say you want to be a national champion UTV racer. You need to think about that on a daily basis and keep making strides towards that direction and don't get distracted by the smaller things in life like social media or you know, what people think about what you're doing, you know, concentrate on what you know you need to do in order to succeed. If you want to be successful, it's a choice. Choose to be successful and work towards it every day. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And, and you know, set a huge goal like becoming a national champion UTV racer. I mean, there's so many things you have to accomplish below that, you know. So I would say taking a, a big main goal like that and focusing on it, but also thinking about it and breaking it down into smaller steps and creating, you know, smaller sub goals that uh, you just click off the box one by one. You know, it's just like building these race cars behind us. Yes, the goal is to have a, a completed race car and all done and ready to go to the race, but you have to put on every little piece one by one, you know, to make it happen. Yeah, I think that's a great metaphor for accomplishing something is, you know, when you're building these things, it's literally just yeah. piece by piece. Keeping an eye, like, obviously, stepping back to look at the big picture, <laughs> make sure you're not building some crazy thing. But. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, certainly uh, small steps are what's required to be successful. You can't, you can't just wake up one day and have everything accomplished that you need. You have to take it and break it down 
and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. If you want to be successful, just chip away at it every day. What was the hardest thing for you guys getting to where you are now? If you can pin it on one thing, how did you oh get boy. there? Oh boy. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'd say one of the toughest things I've had to deal with over my career um, is back when I was racing motocross, I had a ton of injuries and they weren't small. Um, you know, I've broken my legs four times and every time I would, it was not just a small fracture, it was a major break with surgery, you know, my femur and, and both tib and fib with rods and pins and screws and, and everything. Um, so I had a lot of setbacks and a lot of uh, thoughts of, you know, is this worth it? And, uh, you know, when those thoughts start creeping in and, and, you know, a couple hours later, it's like all I can think about is getting back to it, you know? So uh, definitely that was one of the bigger challenges I've ever had to face is, is just injury after injury after injury and trying to come back from that. And before we go to you, Cody, what was the, what, like, that's, those are huge injuries to experience and obviously continuing to race, you had, that risk again, like what, what trumped the, the risk for you in your head? Um, I, don't, I don't know that after I was healed I ever thought about the risk of, oh, this can happen again, you know. Of course it did happen again, but uh, it seems like every time when I would recover, um, it was just out of my head, you know. It kind of goes back to we've been doing this so long, it's, it's what we know, you know. It's just who we are. So you, wait, you broke both of your legs multiple times? Yeah, so when I was, I was 15 and I, let, no, let's see, it was 01, so I was, yeah, maybe 15, and we were having a race out here, and uh, it was a two-day race, and I don't remember why I was riding, but I was, and uh, I was riding a, a buddy's four-wheeler that he wanted me to check out because he had just built it. And we had a step up jump over there and I came over the top of the jump and landed. There was tra one of our guys was on a tractor just prepping the track and I came over the jump and landed right in the bucket of the tractor. Crushed my jaw and luckily broke my leg and that was it, you know, but the bucket hit me right there. So, you know, if it was that much lower, it'd have been no more head. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, I got care flighted out of that. So that was a pretty long recovery I had two pin, luckily two pins that were sticking out of the bone. So it wasn't like getting them removed was just the doctor grabbed them with pliers and pulled them out. Um, so I healed up from that, which took about five months and went to the first national race and I was in the B class at the time and I won that race and came back and we did a local race the next weekend and had a bike problem on the face of a jump and just landed so hard that it broke my tibia and fibia again but in a different spot. It broke it here the first time and then down here the second time. So I had two plates put in and uh, that was healing pretty good. And then that got a staph infection. So I had to have an IV to my heart and that I had to get this antibiotic in like every four hours for, uh, I think it was like two or three months. And so that was nearly a year recovery because of the staph and have to have surgery again, get the hardware removed or part of the hardware removed. And uh, so got past that and that was in 02 and I raced in 03 and 04 and had two really good seasons in 05. At the second national, I crashed from the start and broke my opposite tibia and fibia and had to have a rod put in that. Um, and I didn't want to start racing again. Like I pretty much missed that season. So at the end of the season, I had the rod taken out because you don't want to break your leg again with it in there or it could be really, really bad. Um, so that was 05. Then 06, um, Cody moved up to pro and I was racing pro-am still. And uh, at the third round, second or third round, Cody crashed and broke his femur. Well, we came home and two weeks later, I went to Maryland by myself, pretty much. I had one buddy with me, and I broke my femur up there. So I was in the hot, and when I did, I got compartment syndrome in my leg, and so they had to do a fasciotomy, and I had to get blood transfusions and all that stuff, and I was up there in the, uh, the hospital up there for like almost two weeks. And um, yeah, that was four, four 
really big ones for sure. Wow. Yeah, over the course of four years. So. I think if you were thinking about the risks after <laughs> yeah. that, you wouldn't have uh, done it ever again. Yeah, maybe so. Motocross was a whole lot more dangerous than the side-by-side -side racing we do now. So yeah, like, one of the things we really, really appreciate about racing the cars that we do now is that we're somewhat safe in comparison to what we used to be. Yeah. Your biggest risk in these is like fire. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we build them, you know, very safe so that, you know. Yeah. What was the question we were leading up towards? So it was uh, like, what was the hard, like the, a, big, a big challenge for you as you moved up in your career um, and how you got through it? Um, honestly, for me, uh, one of the bigger challenges is a little different from Hunter. Uh, trying to stay focused on racing as opposed to getting caught up in like social life, uh, staying out all night and partying and, and doing things that all of my friends were doing. You know, I always had to somewhat have a curfew for myself and, and focus on, on staying focused during the day and not getting distracted at night so that I would not be worth a dang the next day. Um, trying to stay away from that nightlife, you know, has, has always been a bit of a challenge for me, but, uh, kind of learned to have a healthy balance and it taught me a lot to about uh, self-respect and uh, ways to to enjoy my life and enjoy social uh, gatherings and stuff but not to get so distracted that uh, that I would turn myself into a worthless pile of doo-doo at the end of the day um, that's uh, it's, it's always been a challenge but it's something that's taught me a lot about self-respect and, and staying goal-oriented I'm sure you're grateful that you took that route and yeah. got down there. Yeah, my life now uh, is is nothing short of bliss. I mean, I've got uh, a lot of really fun toys and a uh, beautiful girlfriend, and I, I still have a great social life, but I've been able to stay away from the distractions enough so that I've been able to be very successful. Sweet. I'm glad for both of you um, that gotten to this point. What's something that you're excited about in the next six months to a year? Um, so our, our biggest event of the year is always, uh, or it has been for the last four years, this King of the Hammers event. And uh, currently all the race cars that are behind me are uh, vehicles that we're building for that race. And certainly that's our, uh, that's our Super Bowl of the year. And we're always excited to get to go out and do that. And to climb up this ladder that we have to do each year to prepare for it. There's always new challenges and we're always trying to progress so we have to kind of push the envelope and do things that no one else is doing in order to be successful at it. Um, in the UTV race, uh, we're, we're pretty comfortable with, with being successful in that, uh, but there's another event that we do which is the 4400 race in the unlimited class and we're putting our side-by-sides up against uh, full-blown uh, half a million to a million dollar trucks that are, you know, three or four times the horsepower that we have, and uh, and they're they're unlimited. It's an unlimited class. So, in order for us to take these, in order for us to take these semi-production vehicles and go out there and compete against an unlimited budget open class vehicle, takes a lot of push in the envelope uh, for what the vehicle can do, and you know we have to constantly figure out ways to make the, the cars better and perform as well as some of these machines that are on a whole different playing field. Yeah, definitely. Uh, King of the Hammer is coming up. That That's what we've been working for. I mean, it, we've been working six, seven days a week since March, uh, getting ready for it. So a lot of effort all the way from building the chassis up to now assembling the cars and just planning and organizing and getting ready for it. Uh, it, it's obviously a, a ton of work, but it's very fulfilling, and we look forward to it every year. How are you guys feeling going into it? Confident? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, we, you know, we always feel confident going in because, you know, all we're doing is building upon what we have done and been successful with in the in the years past, and trying to improve every year. Um, this year for the 4400 race, we're debuting some all new vehicles that. Uh, we designed with uh, the help of some of our sponsors and uh, you know we're, we're really excited to get out there and start testing those and, and see how we stack up. Cool. Well I'm excited for you guys. I'll uh, look for, are you going to do it again?
I uh, hope so. We'll see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if Can Am is going to do a video like what they did last year, but certainly we will have our own production going on of uh, daily videos that are coming out, sort of showing and sharing our experience at the King of the Hammers. How do we follow that? Uh, if you go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, uh, you can check out. We're we're going to be uploading videos constantly throughout our experience before and after KOH, and uh, you know throughout the year even in all of the other events as well. You know, we, we constantly put up what we try and make somewhat entertaining videos that are not just about racing, but also about the daily life and the struggles and the, the real things that have to happen behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and definitely, obviously, our uh, Facebook and Instagram as well, mainly Instagram. Uh, we try to keep everybody up to date on there. Uh, right, one last question. What's your favorite part about living in Greenville, Texas? Huh. My favorite part about living here in this part of Texas is that uh, we all live on the same property here. We have our race shop, we have our glass shop, my brother has his house, and right next door I have my house, and uh, my parents live here as well. So it's uh, it's really just quite a homey feeling whenever we're here, and it's, uh, it definitely feels like you know, anytime we travel to other places, it's it's enjoyable, it's nice to get away, but it's always like we're always dying to get back home and, and have that home atmosphere. Yeah, definitely. We have a pretty nice little setup here, and uh, we're out in the country, away from most people. And uh, but it's not a, a far drive to town either. So um, just kind of have our own little oasis here that uh, we really enjoy. That's great. Well, thank you guys for sitting down and chatting. It's awesome. Yeah, no problem. It. Yeah, you bet. Well, Thanks for driving all the way from Massachusetts. Come talk to us. Cody and Hunter, what a duo, huh? Hope you had fun listening to that conversation. I know I had a good time talking to them. It was totally wild. Every time I talk about the different people that I interviewed, I'm just brought back to the physical location where I met them and how varied all of these places are. Uh, I met Cody and Hunter at their shop, which was they live on this giant property in Texas, and I rode or drove down a really long driveway. They had built ponds all around the place and uh, kind of a sweeping road to get to their big shop that they had just built, an absolutely beautiful building right next to their family's glass business and uh, just a really kind of homey vibe. And especially on a rainy day, that was welcome. So anyways, that is Cody and Hunter. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Eyes Up Life podcast. Leave it a review if you liked it. Give some feedback if you have some feedback. I always appreciate that. And also be sure to follow Eyes Up Ride on Instagram for updates. Check out the video with Cody and Hunter that just came out a couple days ago. Uh, that is on my Instagram page as well as the Maxis Tires YouTube page, which is just Maxis Tires. We still have a handful of episodes left in the series, so in two weeks we'll be blessed with the presence of Jason Wygant, who was the very first interview in the series. I met him in one of the Carolinas, I think North Carolina. Anyways, that is in two weeks. Hope you can wait that long. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening today. Be safe. Oh, and make sure you turn on the driving focus feature on your phone. If you don't know how to do it, head to eyesupride.com slash resources. It is a no-brainer and an easy way to save lives by turning off those pesky notifications while you're in the car and tempting you to take your eyes off the road when that is the only thing that matters focusing on the road ahead speaking of the road ahead there's only two weeks until the next episode we'll talk to you then thanks for listening bye-bye